what they are in fact is they are the invocations. So it's the verba ignata which actually calls the angels to do the work that you need. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today we are excited to chat about the method of the Ars Notoria Grimoire by welcoming back Dr. Stephen Skinner. Dr. Skinner is an internationally acclaimed author, practicing magician and scholar, and his latest upcoming tome is entitled Ars Notoria, The Method. This is a follow-up book to a previous tome, The Ars Notoria, The Grimoire of Rapid Learning by Magic, which Dr. Skinner released with Daniel Clark. The Ars Notoria gives extensive prayers and orations to be recited while contemplating detailed images called the nota or note. The practical goal by monks and others in the Middle Ages was to use the Ars Notoria to rapidly acquire information related to grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, the so-called seven classical liberal arts. In that first book, Dr. Skinner and Daniel Clark present not just one, but five complete sets of note taken from various manuscripts, alongside a corrected edition of Robert Turner's English translation of the Ars Notoria from 1657. It was also the first time an English text oriented to practitioners has ever been published, along with manuscript images of full sets of note. And the discussion on that first book of the Ars Notoria is episode number 57, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. And you will need that first volume of the Ars Notoria to be able to use and appreciate the second volume, Ars Notoria, The Method. And that is what we're talking about in this episode, where Dr. Skinner shares about the practical tips needed to make the method work, how he detangled the Byzantine web of instructions and prayers from the source material to make it more accessible, what he found is needed during an operation versus what he found could be left out, some keys to actually recite Citing the names in the book, Dr. Skinner answers your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions, and so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Dr. Stephen Skinner. Dr. Stephen Skinner, thank you so much, sir, for coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast. Oh, it's definitely good to be here again. Thanks, sir. I'll stand up. Was the plan always to create a second volume, or did this kind of arise naturally or organically after you finished the first Ars Notoria book? Well, the plan was definitely not to do more than one volume, but it was only when we got stuck into that that we realized how complicated it was. So we were relying initially on a 17th century translation, didn't realize that it was fragmentary, that the guy had translated all of the Christian prayers, but very small amounts of the actual invocations. So as my interest has always been the invocations rather than the prayers, I was a bit shocked that uh, it wasn't there. And so although we included the 17th century translation in the first volume, it became obvious that we needed to go deeper and go into stuff which hadn't been translated before, i.e. the the Latin text of the manuscripts. One of the things that I hear the most, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, especially when people look at the Turner translation, is that there almost needed to be this second volume because just reading the text alone, like the Turner text, without any of the supplementary material, it just seems so complex and out of order. And where are the instructions and how the heck do you do this? Can you just share a little bit about the need for a second volume to kind of detangle all this stuff? I was shocked at how complicated it was. It wasn't even in order from the original Latin. It's only a fragment of the Latin. And Turner obviously didn't understand it very well. His his translation of the Latin prayers and the instructions is quite good, but only partial. Uh, At that point, we realized that more had to be done, but we'd already finished more or less uh, 440 pages. So we published volume one and then set to work um, over the next year or so doing volume two. 
for someone like myself or a lot of the listeners, we just see the end product. We don't see the incredible amount of detangling and going through the old texts and cutting out repetition and all of the the kind of background work that goes into that over weeks and months and years. When it comes to the second volume, how did you unpick the text? What texts were you going through? How did you shorten the text in terms of the final product? Well, because when the Ars Notoria transferred itself to Italy, it began to be copied in monasteries. And what the monks did was they added various glosses, i.e. explanations. And so you get one small bit of the original text, and then on top of it, you get gloss number one, and then on top of that, gloss two, gloss three, etc. And even looking at the manuscript, you can see little red lines connecting one part with the next and so on. So it, it became quite difficult because some of the people writing the glasses merely just took other stuff that they'd already read, messed it up, digested it, spat it out again, <laughs> and wrote it. The, the manuscript we finished up using was one in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's the Latin manuscript 9336. Boy, was it a big one. The actual pages are physically very big, and the handwriting is tiny. So on a digital copy, it has to be blown up quite a bit to read it. That's the manuscript we used because it had all of the commentaries or glosses on the original text. And after going through it a number of times, the structure became apparent. And then we decided that we should organize it according to the medieval curriculum, so according to the subject. Because really, if you want to learn a particular subject, uh, you don't want to read all of the theological arguments, etc. You want to go straight for, for example, arithmetic or geometry or astronomy. Interestingly, it doesn't say astrology. It is astronomy that you can uh, learn using the Ars Notoria. You want to go straight to the subject, and then you want to see what are the ingredients. So the ingredients on all of these are three things. First of all, there's prayers, which are Latin. And these are designed to condition the person working the operation in the terms of the manuscript to purify him so that he's capable of receiving the, the knowledge, which according to the text comes from angels. So there's the Christian prayers. Then there's the note, which are the amazing illustrations. And I was originally fascinated by the note because they were not published in the version that has found its way into the back of the Lamegaton. They were not published in Turner's translation. And when I started looking at the various manuscripts, I found five very beautiful sets of note. I published them in the first volume so that you can go there and have a look. They're pretty amazing. So that's the second element. And then the third element is verbe ignota or unknown words. And the commentary says these are from Greek, which is partially true, from Chaldean, which is not quite true, and um, other languages. But what they are, in fact, is they are the invocations. So it's the verba ignota, which actually calls the angels to do the work that you need. Because they're called in this way, the grimoire doesn't have all of the usual things about uh, circle on the floor, or layman protection, etc., etc. But it relies upon a lot of prayers to get that protection before you start. So those are the three elements. And so I went through and arranged things by subject. So you went to arithmetic and it gave you the correct prayers for that, the correct note for that, split up according to the different numbers, and the correct verba ignited the actual invocations. So pulling that lot out of the mass of Latin in the manuscript, that was the hard work. But the work is done now, and so readers reading it now don't have to worry about that. You can just go in there straight away and hopefully begin to use it. The method's a little bit more complicated. It doesn't involve all of the elaborate tools that Solomonic magic involve, or very complicated astronomical calculations which uh, image magic involves. Do some of the different Solomonic traditional method uh, aspects apply to the Ars Notoria? So, for example, you've written extensively about the Egyptian priests going back 2,000 years. 
you know, smell, for instance, was a very big deal and purifying the body and fasting. Does that aspect of smell, for example, in your experiments, does that also have an effect when you're doing an arsenatoria experiment? No, arsenatoria is amazingly quite different from the, the Solomonic method. So you don't have the, the complicated timing, you don't have the complicated equipment, and a lot of the uh, prohibitions which date back in the Solomonic tradition to ancient Egypt also don't apply. So I think this is a form of angel magic which has come from somewhere else altogether. I tried hard to force it into either the image magic box or the Solomonic ritual evocation box, and it wouldn't fit either of them. When it comes to the note itself, this is something that I've always wondered is when it says to, you know, contemplate the note or the nota, do you do that for a set amount of time? Is it, you know, 20 minutes, an hour? No, there isn't a set amount of time. One of the commentaries says uh, that you should look at it for as long as it takes you to say the Lord's Prayer, but that's just a monkish comment. The word that the Latin uses is to inspect the note, which sounds a little bit strange, but it comes from the same sort of root as speculum. And when you think of speculum, you think of John Dee, you think of looking into a crystal glass, etc. So I think that the essence of the method there is actually to look at it and allow it to influence you rather than reading it. In fact, it specifically says don't read the note at one point. You just get an overall impression. And from that, then when you say the invocation, the angelic forces invoked by the invocation, plus your connection with the note, should transmit the knowledge that you're looking for into your head. And this actually, Dr. Skinner, I think goes to the uniqueness of the Ars Notoria, as you were saying. And we have a listener question to that point from Damien, who is asking, you have written, Dr. Skinner, about how there are certain universalities to the methods of evocation magic, comparing, for example, Solomonic manuscripts and certain rites in the PGM. What about the Ars Notoria, Damien is asking? Are you aware, Dr. Skinner, of any other unrelated lineages of magical practice that engage in similar methods for similar ends? Okay, there are in uh, European, Northern European context, various methods for improving your memory, like visualizing the inside of a, a large building and placing the piece of information you want to remember in a particular room, visualized in a particular drawer. This is a method that, that I use and it's very effective, but it's not the same as Ars Notoria. It doesn't rely upon angels. It relies upon your, your visualization powers. There were methods for that because in, say, the 12th century, 13th century, which is what we're talking about here, so that's where the manuscripts come from, you couldn't just go out. You couldn't download a book. You couldn't even go and buy a book because they were very expensive because they were manuscripts and they were handwritten very carefully taking many hours, maybe many days. Even when you attended lectures, you needed a notebook to write the main points in. And even the notebook made of parchment were very expensive. So a lot of scholars in those days and monks had to rely upon their memory. So they would get the loan of a book and memorize large chunks of it. So that was key. So that was why that was very important. You could say it's not very important anymore because our computer hard drive is our memory, but it's still very useful to remember things. So no, there is no similar system, leaving aside the complicated building room and visualization method for this. The other half of the question was, are there any other strands separate from either the astrological image magic or the Solomonic evocation? And yes, there are a couple of, um, shall I say, oddball grimoires. The, the grimoire of Abtol Cater, for example, doesn't easily fit into either of those traditions. There are a couple of strange grimoires which don't fit into the two main streams, but those two main streams of grimoires cover 97, 98% of all grimoires. 
Dr. Skinner, to that point, this is something you kind of mentioned online and a little bit when we were chatting about volume one, which is about your own personal results. And and to that, we have a listener question from Catherine Devereaux, who is asking, I would love to hear any further developments Dr. Skinner feels comfortable sharing on personal practical use of the Ars Notoria. I know that he mentioned when last you spoke that he was experimenting before. Are there any results that Dr. Skinner may feel like sharing or any insights on practical application of the note that would be met with most grateful ears, Catherine says? <laughs> Yes, I would never work on a text and not actually experiment with it because um, if it didn't work, then I just wouldn't uh, persist. The Arsenatoria definitely works, and the things that I've done, I've tested it with modern languages, and my memory on, on some of that is, is considerably improved. I also tested it on Cohen Greek, and it's worked there as well. And I've tested it on a few other people who didn't really expect to have to learn stuff. And amazingly, they've uh, memorized stuff fairly easily. The other big notable thing was that the Latin prayers, if they're put in or they're left out, doesn't seem to make any difference. So although the Ars Notoria said that there are three elements, the Latin prayers, the Verba Ignata, and the Note, it's really only the last two that are practically effective. So I've left out the, the Latin prayers to a large extent. So if they're only a preparation of one's own spirituality, then I should just make the assumption that that's already done. We do have a listener question, Dr. Skinner, from Jeff Smith, who says, has Dr. Skinner found the Ars Notoria system to work well with other languages? And you mentioned Greek, Dr. Skinner, and Jeff saying, for instance, you know, Chinese that uses non-phonetic characters that convey entire ideas and concepts. Does it work with other phonetic systems, such as hiragana for Japanese or hangul for Korean? I read a little bit of classical Chinese, so I haven't needed to use it for that. But somehow I think that a non-alphabetic language is probably going to be more difficult. Just as a joke, I might suggest that, that Western angels probably are not well equipped with Oriental languages. However, talking seriously, the answer is try it. Don't ask me. I've done enough to convince myself that the system works and to decide which parts of the system are necessary and which parts are not. Beyond that, I'm publishing this, and it's then up to uh, you guys at the world at large to use it or not as you wish. We do have a listener question from Damien who is saying, Dr. Skinner, what, what do we know about the origins of the Ars Notoria and its predecessors? Do we have any knowledge about how the original method itself first came about? The short answer is not much. The clue is in the name of the four supposed authors. I mean, they're probably supposed authors, but those names represent the streams of knowledge that have come into Ars Notoria. So... The major original author that's given credit is Solomon, of course, because it's a magical grimoire. Secondarily, credit is given to Honorius of Thebes. And that is very interesting because Honorius of Thebes, his father, is given credit for writing the Liber Juratus. And there's a number of prayers in Liber Juratus which have been taken from the Ars Notoria. So the Ars Notoria definitely came first and Liberatus took advantage of those prayers and invocations. The names of the people who are the supposed authors are def definitely an indication of where the knowledge came from. The third author that's usually credited is Mani, the uh, Persian prophet. And that's a bit more obscure, but he wrote in a language which is sometimes referred to as Chaldean, so that might explain why the unknown words, the invocation words, are said to be partially from Chaldean. So they may have come from Manichaean texts, but that's a little bit uncertain. But we have one concrete fact. And the concrete fact is that on one of the note, the image is of an upside down pillar sitting, so sitting on a a massive stone head, which is also placed upside down. And that's a very weird image. You think this is sort of a fantasy image or something. 
but I recognized it because I have uh, spent some time in this temple and I realized that this is one of the statues that are actually in the large water system underneath this temple. This was created by uh, Justinian in, I think, was it the 6th century, maybe in the 7th, where he stole a number of pillars from pagan temples, including a Medusa head, and used them to build his system. Now, the Medusa head, as a sort of insult to pagan religion, was placed upside down, and then a pillar was placed on top of it. Now, that is a pretty unique image. And there is the image, the actual physical Medusa head upside down with a pillar on top of it in Istanbul. So my conclusion from that is that the Ars Notoria passed through or may even have been originated in, in Istanbul. In the time that it came there, in the 7th and the 11th century, Istanbul would have been Greek-speaking. And so... I can be sure that the original, the origins of this are in Greek, that they passed through or may have been originated in Constantinople, otherwise known as Istanbul. So there's a piece of concrete information. Now, so they're part of Greek culture. What they were before that, whether it was Manichaean or Egyptian or something, is less certain. So therefore, going further on, when they came to northern Italy, to Bologna, I can say for certainty that the Latin prayers were added at that point, and therefore they're not part of the original method. So this was confirmed by my practical experiments that they were not necessary. And so in the second volume, a lot of the Latin prayers have been truncated. And don't worry about that. The, the important whole Latin prayers are there, but the, the bits that have been dropped in have been removed to clean it up and make it a lot easier to read. So that's the best I can do with its origins. So its origins were Greek language. Its origins were Constantinople. Before that, I'm not sure. Dr. Skinner, we also have a question from Craig Porter, who is asking, Dr. Skinner, can the Ars Notoria be used or adapted to study subjects other than the classical liberal arts? Well, I haven't tried using it for computer programming or anything that is ultra-modern. But the actual medieval curriculum was pretty effective. It started with grammar, which was learning a language. So I'm pretty sure that those note can be used for learning all sorts of languages. So it gives you the structure of the language that you're working on. It then goes on to rhetoric. Now, rhetoric is the ability to speak well. Now, anybody who's had to present a paper or at a conference or simply just talk to a mass of people needs rhetoric. So that is a useful part of the, the thing. Beyond rhetoric, you then have dialectic or logic. Again, that increases your ability to think up arguments and to think up counteraction to those arguments. So that's a useful subject. It's not currently taught in school or university as a formal subject, but it's a very useful skill to have. And then you go on to the second group of traditional subjects, and those are all number related. So there are things like arithmetic and geometry and strangely music. But skill with numbers, I'm sure, can relate to, say, computer programming or statistical analysis or whatever. So I think that these skills can be brought forward into the modern era. Dr. Skinner, in terms of expanding kind of the traditional use of this, Jeff Smith is asking, Dr. Skinner, is using other mnemonic systems in conjunction with the Ars Notoria a good idea? If one doesn't like the Christian flavor and wants to keep in line with a Greco tradition, would creating prayers to mnemosyne be appropriate, for example? My short answer is no. First of all, it's not necessary because I give you all permission to drop out the Christian prayers because I've proved to my own satisfaction that they're not an essential part of the, of the experiment. So the other invocations are in Greek, in Chaldean, etc. So you don't need to generate any new Greek prayers for those. Problem solved. I think this this next question kind of fits well in the in the theme of the Ars Notoria. It's another listener question from Catherine Devereaux, who's asking, 
Additionally, if Dr. Skinner feels so inclined, Catherine says that she'd love to hear his understanding of ancient and early modern philosophical or theological concepts of memory and learning within the larger concept we refer to today as philosophy of the mind. At one point in the orations, Catherine says God is called to restore knowledge as he did for Solomon. And, and so Catherine's question really comes from this statement. Is memory or knowledge an issue of re-remembering or is memory or knowledge more about learning something new? The very short answer is that the purpose of the Alcantara is to learn something new. If you're picking up a new subject that you've never done before, there's, there's no question of recalling it from before. However, Catherine's wider questions are more theological and, and I, I don't intend to go into them. I'm more interested in practical applications. Let somebody else work out the theology. We do have another question kind of related from Jess Smith, who's saying, the note illustrations or plates remind me of some of the work that Mary Carruthers has done in her books talking about the methods that medieval monks would use in developing powerful memories in the book of memory, a study of memory in medieval culture, and the medieval craft of memory. Unfortunately, Jeff says, I've not read Dr. Skinner's Ars Notoria yet, and I haven't looked at the plates, but his question is, are these topics related, if not the same thing, in learning and retaining knowledge by a non-rote method? Well, you haven't read the Ars Notoria, and I haven't read Mary Carruthers, so it's a bit of a moot point that uh, can't really be answered. So it may be the same, I don't know, but I doubt it, because the note were not available. The ones from Yale have been published a few times, but all of the other note particularly the Bibliothèque um, Nationale. Have, uh, just one or two have been published in academic stuff, but the first time full sets have been published is in Volume 1. So Mary Carruthers, unless she looked at Volume 1, probably would not have um, used those images. But I can't, um, I'm only guessing. You've, you've touched on this before, Dr. Skinner, about, for example, realizing through experimentation that, hey, you know, the Latin prayers are not, needed and you can actually cut those out if you choose to but what were some of the other kind of big surprises that you encountered dr skinner when you were kind of either working through detangling the very byzantine labyrinth of of texts or when you were experimenting what were some of the biggest things that kind of stuck out to you or surprised you first of all i, I totally approve of your wording by calling them byzantine that is very true because uh, byzantium is the old name for um, Constantinople and uh, Istanbul, which is where they came from. I was really just shocked at the amount of repetition and the overwhelming unnecessary phrases. You find a sentence which might say, for example, that you use the first day of the moon. And the, the uh, manuscript would take something like five lines to say that the first day of the moon, which is the first day of the cycle of the moon, blah, 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 blah. And, then, and at the end, you could have just said it in three words. That was one of the, the surprises. The other surprise, of course, was that it didn't align with standard Solomonic, well, despite the fact that it gives Solomon as, as its primary author. And also, the, I suppose the, the other surprise was that it worked. I'd read accounts of people like Myrna and uh, 14th, 15th century, testing it by going into the local village and getting, to use his words, not mine, a dozen peasants and using the system on them and being surprised that they then could learn the stuff that the monks were doing. That was sort of interesting and surprising. And originally they arrested man and they were going to do him for being a magician. But when he demonstrated this they were so pleased that they gave him monetary reward. In comparison to the Lamegatons Goetia or some of these kind of more explicitly demonic texts, in the 12 and 1300s, copies of the Ars Notoria were burned and they were condemned. And they said that the Verba Ignota were containing the names of demons. I mean, did that... Did it surprise you knowing all of that going in and then actually experimenting with it and finding out, hey, this actually works and it's not a traditional Solomonic grimoire? Okay, I'm going to pick you up on one fact there. It was not burned with one exception. And that exception was a, 
a version of it rewritten by uh, John Amarini. And uh, I think the, the Paris University actually burned that version. All of the others seem to have happily sat in various ecclesiastical libraries without um, too much trouble. St. Augustine and a few other commentators said that the unknown words in there could easily have been invocations of demons rather than angels. And so that, that furrowed a few brows. I actually found it quite interesting because maybe there are demon names in there, certainly a lot of angelic names. But uh, there was not a massive burning of it. Consequently, I can't remember how many manuscript copies there are floating around libraries in Europe, but it's a large number. In the back of uh, Volume 1, I've got a bibliography which lists all of the manuscripts that I knew about at that time. I've discovered another three or four since then. The thing is that when you look at this, if you're just uh, the, the abbot or another monk, it's so stuffed with Christian prayers that you think it's a prayer book. So I think that the, the Ars Antoria got by in monasteries by looking like a prayer book. So if anybody didn't read too far into it and find the invocations in Chaldean, Greek or whatever, that they would have been happy to figure, yeah, this is acceptable, we'll put it on the shelves. So many more examples of the Ars Notoria have survived than of the more goetic grimoires. And that is actually quite surprising that with so many copies in libraries, that these two volumes that I've done are really the first time it's been published in English extensively. People have just looked at it, neither ignored it or um, shied away from it. The other thing, of course, is there's always the publishing cost of, of many color plates, which uh, Golden Horde happily absorbed, and which enabled me to publish a full five sets. Prior to that, there was only a couple of them floating around as illustrations in academic papers. Yes, thank you, Dr. Skinner. And, and yes, it was it was just that that one copy that was burned. And, and yeah, when you think of John of Moringi, for example, and and people kind of revising this or, you know, taking the note out, you're really removing one of the key aspects of the method, the inspection of the note that's necessary for it to work. Yeah, you're destroying the, the method altogether. Without the note, you're simply reading invocations or reading prayers, and it doesn't work. I also experimented with that, but it doesn't work just by itself. Interestingly, Every single copy of the Ars Notoria that is in any Central European library is missing the note. So it can't have been used practically uh, in any of those contexts. The copies that do have the note are uh, either in England or Italy. Those are the main ones. And it's the sheer labor of, of writing out, I don't know, 60 or 80 note, not writing them out, but drawing them. Some of them are beautifully executed. Strangely enough, there's no rubbishy version of the note. So people were very serious about it. When they actually did want to draw the note, they took their time and drew it very well. So one of the things I've done in the second volume is instead of just publishing the whole page with three or four note on the page, I've separated the note and just published a single note with that particular invocation. So it makes it much, much more, more logical. Can you share, Dr. Skinner, a little bit about where can people either pre-order their copy or where can they get their copy of the second volume of the Ars Notoria? Because of COVID, Golden Horde is not easily supplying copies. So it is probably better to buy them from Amazon.com or from Golden Horde's distributor, which is Llewellyn. So Llewellyn will be, will probably have the first stock in the U.S. Is there anything else that we haven't discussed about the second volume or about the Ars Notoria in general that, that you would like to leave listeners with as they anticipate picking up a copy of this second volume? Yeah, just, just briefly. The Ars Notoria is easier to do than the grimoire uh, evocationary things like the Goetia or the Key of Solomon. But don't be fooled by that. It's still a serious piece of magic, and you have to do it properly. One of the things I've seen when I've seen people experimenting with grimoires is they tend to gabble. 
let's get through this invocation with all these strange names as fast as possible. No, you should read it because of the, the Asmatoria, actually a series of angel and possibly demon names. You should read it carefully. In the book, I made the suggestion that it should be like roll call in school, the, the name of a particular angel, and then there's a pause, and then the next one. Now, in the printed Latin versions, they're just, the names are separated by commas, but in the manuscript, they're separated by midline dots and sometimes double slashes, which indicates that there really should be pauses between. So you, you read it carefully. At the same time, you should be looking at the, the note and you should be observing it. First of all, you look at all the detail and then you sit back and look at it from a distance because you want the note to affect you while you're reading the invocation. So if all that's done well, it will work well for you. You could say, okay, this is a lot easier than, than manufacturing wand and sword, um, painting a floor circle, etc., etc., which is what Solomonic evocatory magic involves, or for astrological image magic. So we have a third stream here, and it has some drawbacks, but it also has some advantages. But its objective is to aid your memory and to aid you in learning whole subjects or new subjects or improving your grasp of those subjects. It's easy to get carried away with how to pronounce things. And I'm going to get in huge trouble for saying this, but I, I think a lot of people might get trapped in a vibratory mode where they go, ah, here's the Ars Notoria book. I'm going to vibrate this name as if I'm an opera singer and stretch it out over, you know, 35 seconds or something instead of roll call, as you say. The vibrate this name is very much a golden dawn, shall we say, improvement on magical method. But it's not necessary for Argentoria. You're calling the angel like you might call a schoolboy standing on the podium. Atkins, Brown, etc., etc. And that's it. You may think that you're just speaking to yourself or to the, the room, but you'd be surprised how many of the angels and demons actually hear what you say. Don't always react to it, but they do frequently hear it. Internationally acclaimed author, practicing magician and scholar, Dr. Stephen Skinner. Dr. Skinner, thank you just so much for taking the time in this podcast and sharing a little bit about your second volume of the Ars Notoria. My pleasure entirely. Thank you. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Dr. Stephen Skinner as much as I did. I always appreciate his time and wisdom and his reminders not to garble or rush the invocations or when reciting the names is so needed, as well as an encouragement to see for yourself if the Latin prayers are needed to make the operation successful. Also, thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon for your support and your questions, which, as usual, are a joy to ask and take the conversation in new and interesting ways. And if you'd like to support Glitch Bottle and get exclusive perks, please consider hopping on the Glitch Bottle caravan at patreon.com slash glitch bottle. And as always, you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Keep the light.